Well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. I really appreciate you showing up because I know you have a million other things to do. Um, I'm Dr. Vanessa Ament, as some of you know, and it is my incredible pleasure to introduce this very dear friend of mine who has agreed to come and spend time with us. Some of you saw, saw him in classrooms today or seen him around the school. Um, John Semper Jr., who I have known since 1987, is a writer, he is uh, a director, a producer, a showrunner, uh, he knows animation, he knows film history, he knows live action, he knows television and film, he knows Muppets, he knows all things about children's programming and animation, he knows more about film <coughs> history than I will ever know in my lifetime. Uh, and he is one of the most engaging people I have ever known and an absolute master networker in the film industry. We've known each other since we were just young little lads and lusses. And um, I am so delighted that I can share him with you. So please enjoy the evening here with John and uh, thank you so much for coming. And at this point, I want to introduce to you John Semper. I think I'm mic for the video, but there we go. Hi, everyone. Testing, one, two, can you hear me? There we go, I can hear myself now. Uh, I'm gonna run a video for those of you who don't know who I am or what I've done or anything like that. Uh, I'm gonna run this video and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk, okay? Uh, universities and institutions of higher learning all over the world are filled with young, agile minds like yours gathered in hallowed halls like this. Uh, with the intent that your minds and spirits should be filled with hope and inspiration for the journey of life ahead of you after listening to an inspiring lecture by boring old farts like me. Um, I promise you that in my lecture tonight I will not be inspirational. I will not use words like triumph, endurance, innovation, or vision, nor will I quote people like Bill Gates, Maya Angelou, Steve Jobs, or Buddha. Um, nobody is more shocked than I am to now find myself old enough to be an old codger standing before your young formative minds. It seems like yesterday that I used to be you, and I have no idea how I, how I suddenly find myself in my current state of immense wisdom and withering decrepitude. Um, but tonight I will do everything in my power to dissuade you from a life in the entertainment industry, because I cannot in good conscience do anything but. When I was first approached by my longtime friend of many decades, Dr. Vanessa Ament, to come speak to you today, I was unsure if I was the right person to inspire such eager young minds. And I'm really thrilled that so many of you showed up for this. This is really quite wonderful. Um, I asked her, Vanessa, what would you want me to do there at Ball State University? And she turned to me and she said, John, you may call me Dr. Ament. Um, so I said, Dr. Ahmed, what would you want me to do there at Ball State University? And she replied, first we'll have you come to a class and talk with students about animation, uh, history, and the creative side of animation. And I thought, okay, I can do that. Then she said, we'll have you come to another class and we'll converse with students about the business, you know, networking, working with clients, stuff like that. Well, that sounded okay. Um, and then she said, later we'll have you chat with students about the entire entertainment business in general with breaks for lunch and dinner, that will fill up most of the day. And I said, well, that seems sort of casual and fun, so yeah, you know, I can handle that. And then she turned to me and she said, um, and after dinner there will be a lecture, and I thought, well, that sounds very nice indeed. I wonder who's lecturing. <laughs> she turned to me, uh, I, 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 I was thinking, I hope it's somebody smart, I might actually learn something, and so I asked her, who's going to lecture, and she said, you are, dummy. Um, this threw me into a little bit of a panic, you know, it's, it's uh, me, what am I going to lecture about? Um, and she said, we want you to talk about the experiences that you've had in the entertainment industry that we think will teach students how to break into it someday. And I said, really? And she said, yes. And I asked, so you want, what you want me to do in the body of this lecture is talk about the experiences I've had that specifically will teach students how to break into today's entertainment industry? And she said, yes. So I reiterated 
The entire contents of this lecture only needs to consist of those things that I've experienced in my career that I think will teach students how to break into the entertainment business right at this very moment or in the future. And she said, precisely. That and nothing more. And she said, exactly. So here I am, ladies and gentlemen. This is that lecture in which I will share with you the experiences I've had in my long career that will teach you how to break into the entertainment business. Thank you for having me here. You've been a great audience. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just remembered that in my contract it said I have to do an encore. So um, here I am for my encore. Um, let me explain why I feel that my lecture should have ended right at that moment. Uh, if I'm here to share the experiences that I've had that I think will be of value to you as students um, for breaking into today's entertainment industry, then the fact of the matter is that I don't think a single experience I've had will be of value to helping you break into today's industry. And here's why. Let's just focus on television, which is where I've spent most of my career. When I got into the entertainment industry in 1979, 1979, Television was the same way it had been for my whole lifetime up to that point. There were three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And maybe a fourth if you counted Public Broadcasting Network, which had only been turned into PBS nine years earlier. Prior to that, it was just something that was strung together from a lot of educational statements, uh, uh, stations around the country. So it became PBS the minute, you know, just nine years prior to my getting into the business. So the entire landscape of television was ABC, CBS, NBC, and maybe PBS. That was it. There were no VCRs, no VCRs. And anything, there was nothing that recorded television. So there was no home video marketplace. There was nothing like that. It was ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS, period. And here's how you knew you were in the TV business. You knew you were officially in the TV business if you had a job where the end product ended up being broadcast on ABC, CBS, NBC, or PBS. If you had a job like that, it was, very it was a very prestigious thing indeed because those jobs were very hard to get. Um, once you, but once you got one, you knew you were in, you were actually in the television business. When you got that job, trumpets blared and magic fairy dust sprinkled down on you, okay? Um, so that when other people in that closed club known as the TV industry were looking to hire and you walked into their offices with magic fairy dust all over you, then um, you were first in line to get hired because you were in, you were a special human being and you were magical, like My Little Pony. Um, so, ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS. Contrast that with today. You ready? Today there's ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS, but there's also HBO, TNT, TBS, a and &E, FX, AMC, TCM, HGTV, USA, MTV, ESPN, BET, VH1, OWN, E, CNN, HLN, ABC Family, Spike TV, CNBC, MSNBC, Sci-Fi, Food Network, Lifetime, Logo, Showtime, Bravo, Velocity, DIY Network, Science Channel, The Hub, History Channel, Hallmark Channel, Nat Geo, National Geographic Channel, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Sprout, Nicktoons, Nicktoons Jr., Disney Channel, Disney XD, Disney Jr., True TV, TV Land, Travel Channel, Discovery Channel, this is how I fill up my lecture time. Uh, Animal Channel, uh, Animal Planet, Cinemax, and that's just cable. With the rise of internet streaming, we now have Amazon, Hulu, Crackle, Crunchyroll, Machinima, Netflix, and more to come from the likes of Intel, Verizon, and Apple, who's imminently about to announce some kind of a video streaming network. And trust me, I left a few of these out, okay? So the good news here is that if you want to work for production companies or studios who are creating the programming for any of these networks, the chances are pretty good that you'll be able to find a job. 
Um, but the bad news is that getting a job will not, not necessarily mean that you are in the industry. So what does it mean to be in the industry? Well, let's create a working definition for the purposes of our discussion. What does it mean when you're in any industry? In the medical profession, it means you get up every day and you have a sustainable career healing people or doing research into the art of healing people. Um, if you're a firefighter, you get up every day, head for the station and possibly fight a fire or two. And if you have a career in retail, you go to the store every day to sell things, et cetera, et cetera. The common thread here is that something that you do every day, and hopefully, it's, uh, the common thread is that it's, it is something that you do every day, and hopefully you will earn enough of a salary to live off of and possibly put a little aside for a rainy day or for your old age, which is that thing I'm experiencing right now, my old age. Um, now, as an aside, of course many of you are hoping to hit it big in Hollywood and you'll make a vast fortune and you'll never have to work again. Let's say you create a Star Wars or a Harry Potter, okay? But there's this little place called Las Vegas where dreams like that come true and most of you who are banking on this kind of phenomenon might be better off having a career there. Trust me, the odds are about the same and it's a lot less work for the money, plus the restaurant food is cheaper. Um, so by our definition, if you're looking to be in the TV or movie industry, it's not just about a single job that lasts a few weeks or a few months. And then you're out on the street again which unfortunately is what happens all too often in the entertainment world. Um, when we say we want to be in the industry, we're talking about wanting a series of jobs that keep you busy for a good long stretch and pay you well enough that you can live and that you can live comfortably and you can know that there's a good probability of getting similar jobs in succession in the future. Uh, that's our working definition of being in the industry. And realistically, I'm not sure that the industry can guarantee that to many people anymore. If this is sounding really bleak, there is, a there is a, some sunshine on the horizon, so bear with me, I'll get to that. Um, but why isn't the industry going to be able to support people anymore? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that there's enough money in the industry to sustain the vast amount of programming that's being created or the large number of production houses who want to do the creating. So there's a constant amount of churn or turnover in terms of how long programs last and in terms of who gets money to create new programming. When I got into the cartoon business in 1979, there were only a few games <coughs> in town, a few good sources for kids' animation programming. The networks who regularly aired kids' animation every year, CBS, ABC, and NBC, would only buy from those few sources, the main one being Hanna-Barbera. Uh, they might buy a few shows from Filmation, if you remember Filmation at all. If you, many of you are young, you probably don't know who they were. Uh, they, might buy from, uh, they might buy a show from Ruby Spears, uh, which had been founded by a couple of H&B alumni, Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, who, the guys who created Scooby-Doo. But pretty much everything else came from Hanna-Barbera. I was on staff at Hanna-Barbera under contract, and so I had a pretty steady gig. So every year, when the networks wanted to make cartoons, they came to Hanna-Barbera, a bunch of us were on staff, we wrote all those cartoon shows. So I was definitely in the industry, okay? Today, I couldn't tell you the name of a single animation production entity that routinely supplies the bulk of programming to networks like Hanna-Barbera. Um, there's a lot of animation being produced, but if you're a young woman or a young man who wants to have steady long-term work, I wouldn't begin to know where you can go to find such a place. Much of what's being produced is being done by little boutique operations that sprout up here and there, or larger entities financed by the Disneys of the world, which are put together on a show-by-show -show basis and are frequently disbanded once the show is completed. So, um, here's another big difference between my reality and yours, and, and this is important. When I graduated from Harvard in 1975, there were very few colleges willing to train people to be in the entertainment, indi uh, entertainment industry. It was not considered academic. Teaching people to get into something as frivolous as the entertainment industry or film or television had a little bit of a stench on it. Um, Harvard would let you play with cameras and make film uh, <coughs> make a little bit of film as part of their curriculum, 
but they really didn't want to let people know that that was going on, so they kept you in the basement of this building called Carpenter Center. You were like a demented relative that <laughs> no one was supposed to talk, talk about, you know, hidden in the basement. Um, this building, had, this beautiful building, had been designed by Le Corbusier, and it was lovely, and it was mostly designed to house architectural students. Um, and so all the film happening was going on down in the basement. Um, I got my uh, degree in a department of visual and environmental studies. Um, I got my BA. That's a fancy name, visual and environmental studies. That's how much Harvard wanted to hide the fact that there was any film or photography going on. It was hidden under this title, Visual and Environmental Studies, la di da, okay? Um, that's snobby academic talk for we have nothing whatsoever to do with film, television, or entertainment. Uh, they tried to make film at Harvard as intellectual as possible. There was this one guy named Professor Al Gazzetti who wanted us to watch films by Jean-Luc Godard. Um, and uh, we would have to endlessly discuss this stuff, and, and it was really best if we discussed it in French. Uh, mais je ne comprends pas la mise en scène de cette film parce que le montage ne, ce n'est pas lentement, il est vite et vous les... You know. <laughs> you know, if you're an American and you try to speak French, you, you run the serious risk of choking to death. <laughs> um, the, the way that you can tell that French, the French are way smarter than we are is they can speak French. <laughs> that's, that's the dead giveaway. Um, but I digress. So back in the old days, if you wanted to study film, your options were limited. Those of us young men and women who actually pursued this as a career were a hardy, bold, and slightly offbeat group. We were real fanatics to come to LA. We were like pirates or something. We were oddball rebels who had veered way off the beaten path. Today, look at you. And believe me, I've spent the day with a good deal of you, and I'm very impressed. You guys are incredible. And this facility is incredible. So this is amazing what's going on right now. Um, you're pursuing actual degrees in things like animation, film, TV, screenwriting. I feel like I've slipped into some alternate bizarro universe. This is like nothing I'm used to. And it's great, it's brilliant. There's only one problem though, there are getting to be a whole lot of you. Um, and when I got out to LA, or when I got out to LA, most of the people who were working in the business with, were relatives of people who had already been working in the business. And quite frankly, they weren't all that savvy about or interested in film or TV. They were simply earning gobs of money and happy to be doing it. And it was a very closed club. You practically had to be born into it. But today, the ranks of the working folks in Hollywood have swelled as brilliant, young, well-trained women and men like you all have come flooding into the workforce. It's a tsunami of intelligence and talent. Uh, which has raised the bar of entry to a stratospheric height. Not only is it incredibly hard to compete with this tsunami of talent to get a job, but to sustain a career, one must continue to be excellent on a level that I certainly never had to contend with in the past. So thanks a lot, you guys. Um, therefore, your, your prospects are very bleak indeed. Not only must it be a given that you are the very best at what you do, but the competition is so high that you must sustain that level of brilliance over the long haul. Um, and so those are a couple of reasons why I don't know how my experiences of breaking into the industry can even begin to compare to the gauntlet that you people must face should you choose to pursue a career. Um, in fact, as we enter the brave new world of uh, regular TV and movies, uh, not only of regular TV and movies, but also of computer games, online games, social networks, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Periscope, online porn, and new virtual reality devices like the Oculus Rift, uh, I'm not even sure what the industry is anymore um, or where it's located. However, trying to define the industry is another whole lecture, and I have enough on my plate trying to do this one. So here's the good news, though. I've toured this facility, and I've met a lot of you, and you guys are in a wonderful position to train for this incredibly difficult gauntlet that you're going to face. So the good news is it isn't as easy for you to get into the business as it was for me, although it's never easy. 
Um, but you have the very best kind of training you could possibly have. I mean, you know, it's, this is phenomenal, the facility that you have here and the things that you're able to do. So please take advantage of it. And please appreciate the fact that this is just an incredible opportunity for you. And make good use of it, okay? That's your job, is to make really good use of it. Now, I can't, therefore, really give you great advice on how to break into the industry, but here's what I can do. I can tell you what you're going to face in the industry, and I can give you a little bit of a heads up on how to avoid a lot of the uh, surprise factor, okay? So here, bear with me. And if I were standing here reading this off my notes, I'd be able to look up and look down and look up and look down. And instead, I feel a little cockeyed because I'm trying to look at you guys, but I'm also trying to read this. So uh, forgive me for that. Um, I've, um, okay. I titled this lecture, How to Become Rich, Successful, and Famous in Hollywood Guaranteed. <laughs> and it was based on that title that you chose to come to this lecture and fill this large space. And look at, look at how well that worked. I've got, I've got standing room only. Um, and so it is with some degree of guilt that I must admit that the title is a big fat lie. It's a huge lie. I have no idea how, to, how, to, how you can become rich, successful, and famous in Hollywood. I offer no guarantees because there is no such thing. Um, and even if I did know how to become rich, successful, and famous in Hollywood, I probably wouldn't tell you. <laughs> uh, I'd keep it all to myself. So yes, I lied. So I've come up with um, a list of what I call my Ten Commandments. These are ten practical things that you really should know as you try to navigate your way through a career in the entertainment industry. And I warn you, it's not a touchy-feely, warm and fuzzy, feel-good kind of list. It's a gritty, ugly, real-world list not suitable for children under 12 or people with a history of heart trouble. Does anyone have to leave? Okay, that's good then you're already one step ahead of the game. Commandment, under, uh, commandment number one, never underestimate the value of a good lie, but never lie to yourself or believe your own lies. Okay, so it was a big lie that got you in here, and I'm sorry about that, but it worked. So we're still friends. Um, Hollywood is built on lies. It's an illusion. It's a magic trick. You realize that the first time you're on a soundstage and you touch a brick wall and discover that it's made entirely out of spongy foam rubber. And believe me, that's a real trip when you do that. You know, well, you'll all do that at some point. Um, lying is built into the very fabric of the business. Perhaps it started when the first casting guy walked into the first bar at the intersection of Hollywood Boulevard and Gower Street and asked aloud, is there anybody here who can ride? The hands flew up, and a whole bunch of guys got themselves cast in B-Westerns, even though they'd never been on a horse in their lives, okay? Um, it's part of the fabric of Hollywood. The same came into play when extras lied about whether or not they could swim, claiming that they could when they could not, and then got themselves cast in Michael Curtiz's epic film Noah's Ark in 1928. <laughs> Michael Curtiz, who is something of a sadist, great director, but something of a sadist, um, then dumped tons of water on them to simulate the flood, and it is rumored that some of them died. Some of them drowned to death. Um, lying is everywhere in Hollywood. Uh, studios lie about box office returns. Directors lie about why they leave, they leave movies, citing creative differences. They were fired. Uh, actors lie about how much they love their co-stars. They hate them. Um, it's so much of the fabric of the business that even though you might strive to be a truthful person, you'll probably find yourself lying to somebody about something sooner or later, okay? Um, years ago when I was doing Spider-Man, uh, Avi Arad came and there was one writer that had sort of rubbed him the wrong way and he said, hey, you know, you got to get rid of that writer. I don't like him. And I said, of course, Avi, whatever you want. I'll get rid of that writer right away. And uh, I went to the writer and I said, you know, um, just go away for a couple of weeks. <laughs> just disappear for a couple of weeks. After a few weeks, he'll forget that you even existed and you'll come back. And, and that so I lied. I flat out lied. 
Um, I've told bigger lies, lies that I can't go into here because I don't want to get you legally involved. <laughs> um, lying is unavoidable. If any of you are outraged by dishonesty, then guess what? You are an admirable human being. I admire you. But Hollywood is probably not for you. Um, I told you this was going to be ugly, right? Um, so you lie from time to time, but always know, here's the lesson, always know that you're a lying when you lie. Uh, and don't make the mistake of believing your own lie. There's a, uh, there's a guy, uh, Hollywood's uh, been all abuzz for the past month about uh, the collapse of a major film studio run by a high-flying entrepreneur who in his heyday financed many Hollywood films. This was a gentleman who was considered a consummate showman when he, sit, uh, when he was simply financing films. His company's name could be found at the head of many popular Hollywood films of the last decade, which he co-produced with studios like Paramount, Warner Brothers, and Marvel. Now, like most high-profile uh, high movie moguls, um, he was not shy about acting the part. So he was big spending and flamboyant. He was married to a supermodel. He was flying his helicopter all around town and landing it on roofs of tall buildings. I'm not making any of this up. Um, he worked hard to build up the image of himself as a wonderkind who could do no wrong in this industry. Uh, eventually, he became so sure of his abilities and he was so consumed with believing in living his own hype that he decided rather unwisely to create his own studio to rival those of the majors. Uh, and he began making his own movies. And guess what? He absolutely sucked at making movies. And he had no idea how to make good movies. And as movie after movie bombed, this guy lost a ton of money. And recently, like in the last few months, his company went bankrupt, and the creditors are now, even as we speak, they're haggling over the corpse of his company. Uh, and that's what happens when you believe your own lies. So don't do it. So again, the lesson here is it's okay to hype yourself. It's okay to try to lie a little bit to get a job, but don't put yourself in a position where you are going to basically screw yourself. And don't get too carried away with lying. It's because fundamentally, it's not a good thing to do. Um, Here's my second commandment. Good things frequently arrive looking like straw. Learn how to take straw and turn it into gold. Um, I told this story earlier. Uh, I'm best known for having done Spider-Man the Animated Series. When the show was handed to me, it was a total and complete disaster. It, when it was shiny and new and wonderful, it, it had been handed to an Emmy Award winning guy I'm looking down for the wire. That's how old school I am, uh, the microphone wire. It had been handed to an Emmy Award winning guy, and he had been given the show. And um, everybody was excited, and it was all brand new, and he had a whole year's lead time, and it was wonderful. But he ran into a whole lot of trouble, not, a lot of it not of his own making. And um, eventually, at one point, um, it became apparent that he was not going to be able to get the show done. Now, simultaneous with that, there was a lot of infighting on the show. People were trying to desperately grab control of the show, and he got caught up in all these Machiavellian dealings. And then um, the network got so fed up with everything that was going on at the studio, Marvel Films Animation, that they then kind of decided, well, we'd really like not to do this show after all. Avi Arad, who was the uh, exec producer on the show, he had toy sales at stake because if he didn't get a show on the air, then he was going to roll out a whole line of Spider-Man toys, which he did not think would sell, because if kids didn't know who Spider-Man was, they weren't going to care. Everyone was fighting with everyone else, and that's the show that was handed to me. And I, I said earlier in one of the classes, I think it was handed to me because I looked like a guy who should go down with the ship. You know, it was just a mess. And, and uh, the, I don't think the network really liked me all that much, so it was sort of like, yeah, hand it to him and let him go down with the ship. And, and, and uh, Avi didn't know who I was, and, and it was just a mess. But when it got handed to me as a pile of crap, I knew that I could turn it into gold. Why? Because it was Spider-Man. So you have to work a little harder to take this horrible, horrible situation and turn it into gold. It, I turned it into a number one show. And it's the thing that I'm best known for. So things don't get handed to you in the business like they're all shiny and new and wonderful. Sometimes they do. 
but most often they don't. So you've got to get very comfortable with, with, uh, with grabbing a hold of, of just garbage and turning it into something special, okay? So that's my second commandment. I'm going to try to whip through these as quickly as possible. Um, by the way, not every good thing you do is going to get recognized, and, and, and that's another thing we've talked about in some of the other classes. But um, I, you know, when I did the movie Class Act, I stuck in, at my own decision, I stuck in an anti-drug message. I had a good friend of mine who died of a heroin overdose. <clears throat> so I felt that here I am making an urban comedy. It would be remiss of me if I did not put a if I did not put some message in it that pertained to not using drugs. Um, I put that message in the movie, and when the movie came out and Rolling Stone did a review of it, they said, you know, it's really an interesting film, there's some funny things going on, but it really grinds to a halt when they put in the obligatory anti-drug message. Like, that was somehow very uncool. Well, guess what, Rolling Stone? I'm a citizen of the world, I am a citizen of humanity, I owe it to humanity to do a good thing every now and then. There are a lot of young kids who were watching that movie. I thought it would be really good for them to just, just, just mention that it would be cool maybe if they didn't do drugs. I did it so subtly that you'll hardly even notice it if you see the film, but it's there and that made me feel good. So I did a good thing and I got no reward for it but simply knowing that I did a good thing. So that's something also that you have to get used to in Hollywood is sometimes you'll do the right thing and no one will notice, okay? Um, bad things are not always bad. Uh, this is in my, my third commandment. Bad things, things that seem like they're really horrible are not always bad. Um, I got into this industry as a writer by a fluky situation. My girlfriend, who is also my partner, um, she uh, worked uh, upstairs in the offices at Hanna-Barbera. I haven't told this story today, so this will be new to some of you who have seen me already in the earlier classes. Um, she worked in the upstairs offices as an executive assistant. Well, they decided to downsize and they decided to let go of people, to lay people off. But the woman who was in charge at, at Hanna-Barbera, she had a big heart and she didn't know how to lay people off without hurting their feelings. And so she um, did the, the next best thing, which was to say, you're going to be a writer. I'm going to make you a writer. Well, what that meant was, you're going to be a writer, you're going to fail, and you're gone. But you're not going to be under my watch, so I won't be the person that will have let you go. And I'll, give, I'll be able to sleep at night because I made you a writer. Well, my girlfriend had no interest in being a writer, as you know, was the case with most of those people upstairs. Uh, in the executive offices. So I remember, you know, she was walking the halls and somebody said, uh, you know, did you get laid off? And she said, no, I, I got made a writer. And they went, well, that's too bad. <laughs> I'm really sorry for you. So she came home to me that night. I was working uh, editorial. I started out in post-production. And I was working on um, DC Cab at the time, actually. I was working at Universal. And um, she said to me, um, I got laid off today. And I said, really? Wow. They just came in and let you go? And she said, well, they made me a writer. I said, well, what'd you tell them? She said, I told them no, I don't want to be a writer. I said, well, go back tomorrow and tell them, yeah, you want to be a writer. Well, I don't want to write. I said, well, that's okay, I do. So I'll, we'll be a writing team and I'll do all the writing. And I don't type real well, so you can type everything up. You can read my longhand and you can type everything up and let's just give it a whirl. Well, okay, guess what? That's how my writing career began. That's how our writing career, actually we were partners for a while. Cynthia was the, was the attractive woman that you saw with Stan Lee. We were all standing together with Stan and Spider-Man. Uh, I dragged her into the business. She never really wrote anything, but she was my best editor. Uh, I did all the writing. She did all of the uh, editing and, and the typing back before there were word processors, back in the Paleolithic era. And um, that's how, you know, we, I, we wrote, we uh, got an opportunity to write a Scooby-Doo. I wrote a Scooby-Doo called Scoobzy, which was based on a Dustin Hoffman movie, Tootsie. The network loved it. Let me tell you the key to writing a Scooby-Doo cartoon. Sco uh, everything is about uh, yikes rikes, you know, everybody gets afraid because there's some phantom. Um, and then the phantom chases the gang when they're trying to find him and, you know, gets into a big chase. Scooby and Shaggy had to stop to eat a Scooby snack. Uh, the network loved it if Scooby and Shaggy got into drag. I can never figure that one out, but if you had Scooby and Shaggy in drag, you were in great shape with ABC. 
Um, and uh, then at the end, the mask gets ripped off, and it's none other than whoever the hell it was. Um, and that was basically a fo the formula for every Scooby-Doo cartoon that we ever wrote. But for some odd reason, ABC decided that they liked us and wanted us to write more Scooby-Doo's. So in my first year as a writer, she and I had our names on four Scooby-Doo cartoons, which was unheard of back in those days at Hanna-Barbera. And they said, well, who is this guy and, uh, you know, that you're with? And, and she said, well, John Semper, you, know, you remember him, he used to work in the basement as an editor. And they said, well, bring him in and we'll sign the two of you to a contract because ABC loves you. And we can make money off of you, you know? So, I mean, that's basically the way Hollywood works is that they can make a buck off of you. So that's how the writing career began. It began because somebody got, let, got, you know, got fired, got laid off, okay? So bad things don't necessarily mean that um, uh, a bad thing has happened. It just might seem that way uh, initially. So, okay, back to the prepared text. Um, hang on to your money. <laughs> All right, I've said this in earlier classes. Failure can mess you up, but success can also mess you up. So it's very important that you know how to deal with both, okay? Hang on to your money because you're not going to make it forever. Even though you think you're invincible, you're not going to make it forever. There's a fellow who just passed away. His name is um, Merv Adelson. He co-founded a company called Lorimar, which produced some of the biggest hits in television of the 70s and 80s. Um, he built up his career. At one time, Lorimar had probably the most TV shows on the air of any company in Hollywood. They had uh, shows like Falcon Crest and Dallas and, um, let me see if I've got any others here. Um, I don't know, these are all shows that you're probably not that familiar with, but they were huge hits in their day. Anyway, when this guy sold Lorimar, it got sold, now this is 1988 money, it got sold for 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion, 1.2 billion, billion. In 1988, a billion dollars was a billion dollars, okay? It was a big amount of money. Um, he died last week, and uh, he was practically penniless, all right? So this is a guy who was at the top of the heap in Hollywood, and he lost it all. You're, you're no different. So when you all have success, and, and all of you will accept that guy there, um, I just wanted to see if you were awake. Uh, I wasn't pointing to anyone in particular. Don't get, don't get paranoid. Um, if you have big success, don't assume that it's going to last forever. So hang on to your money. Be wise with your money. Be careful with your money. Okay, that's a very important commandment. Um, here's my favorite commandment. Hollywood is a mecca for sociopaths. <laughs> um, be prepared for this uh, because there's a lot of power and there's a lot of money in Hollywood. So a lot of the people that you're going to run into are in fact very devious, evil people. I cannot sugarcoat that. It's just the way that it is. The best way that you can deal with that is to know that, um, that they are that way, that you're going to inevitably run into them and there's nothing you can do about it, but do not take any of it personally, okay? And don't let them put you down and hurt you. Um, but you will run into them. There's no way out of it because it is for them a fertile ground. It is a place where they can take their skill set and parlay it into gigantic amounts of money and power. Um, and some of the biggest names in the, in the industry are the biggest sociopaths on the planet. I can't say their names because they'll sue me and they'll take everything, <laughs> they'll take all my money away. But um, you should be prepared for that. You know, that's a very important thing. And the thing that I was trying to drive home earlier and, and uh, in Vanessa's class earlier, uh, we just made this point. Um, don't take anything personally. The person that you are is the person that you are. You're going to get into the industry if you get into the industry. And there are going to, going to be a lot of people who are going to try to make you feel really crappy about yourself. Don't take it seriously. It's just the way they operate. It's the way that they elevate themselves. Um, and you just have to deal with it. The way that you can deal with it is to keep your head straight, to know who you are, and to not take any of it um, you know, seriously, he said for the third time. 
So um, at the risk of sounding redundant, I really want to drive that point home, though. I mean, that's just a, that's just a blatant thing. Hollywood is full of sociopaths. So just, just tread lightly and uh, remember who you are. Um, here's my next commandment. Hollywood exa is exactly like school. You will do homework for a living. Um, the, uh, one of my friends, Charlotte Fullerton, said that she's never attended a San Diego Comic-Con without having to race back to her hotel room and continue writing a script that she's working on. You will basically be constantly having to provide somebody with something that they need in a hurry in order to get through their life and existence, and it will be the most important thing in the on the planet. You know, that script is the most important script ever, and you have to have it in my hands by Monday morning or else the planet will die. And that's just the way life is, and you can't, you know, you can't get out of it, you cannot avoid it, it's just the way it is. So you'll be, you will be doing homework for the rest of your life in Hollywood, especially those of you who want to be writers, it's, it's, that's basically what you're doing. You constantly have a paper due and you constantly have to deliver the paper. So it's something that you should be prepared for. Hollywood is exactly like school. However, my next commandment is that Hollywood is nothing like school. So it's called show business, not show art or show education. It's a business. The dollar is the bottom line. The business will do nothing to nurture you or your art. It will only exploit it. And when it's done with you, it will try to cast you off like a squeezed orange. It's nothing personal. Don't take it personally. You know, uh, one of the people who was cast off, believe it or not, in a lot of ways, was Lucille Ball of I Love Lucy. At one point, I Love Lucy fell out of favor. She was doing a show at the time on CBS called Here's Lucy. And it was done. And guess what? Lucille Ball could not get arrested as a performer on camera for decades after that. So it was done with her. I always felt that she should have been one of the golden girls. But, you know, that just would have worked perfectly. I always felt that it should have been Lucille Ball, Ginger Rogers, and somebody else. And they were all alive at the time. But at any rate, when they're, when they're done with you, they're done with you. Now, what that means to you is don't take any of it personally. You are um, only valuable to someone if you can make them a buck. If you can't make them a buck, you have no value. You're coming from an environment where lovely people like Tim are dedicated to nurturing your art and making you better people, better at your craft, better at your skill. This is the last opportunity you're going to have for that to happen. Because once you get in the workforce, you are worthless unless you can make somebody a buck. Then at that point, you have tremendous value, but still nobody's going to care about nurturing you as an artist. They're just going to care about the fact that they can make a buck off of you, and, and you're good for that. That'll make you feel very special, but you know, we as artists want to keep growing. So you're probably going to have to find an outlet to do that. A lot of the famous actors that I've met, um, people like Martin Landau, Barbara Bain, um, oh God, you know, uh, uh, Al Pacino, um, Robert De Niro. I mean, these people all do theater on the side. Al Pacino. I met Al Pacino in the, in the uh, 1970s when I was at Harvard. He was doing theater. He was doing Richard III at the Loeb Drama Center, and he did a little seminar with a bunch of us students, uh, you know, uh, earlier in the day. And we talked about we talked about uh, acting, and we talked about theater, and we talked about directing, and we talked about Shakespeare. This was a guy that was, you know, had just come off of the Godfather movies. This was when Al Pacino was a huge star. But he needed to do that to nurture himself, to nurture his talent. And you guys have to understand that there is a difference between nurturing your talent, which is what goes on here in this lovely environment, and then the real world where they don't give a damn as to whether or not you're going to ever grow as an artist at all. If they can use you, great. If they can use you up, great. Because you know what? The colleges are churning out lots and lots of you, and they'll just keep squeezing all the juice out of you, OK? And um, that's the way the industry works. So you should be prepared for that. See, isn't this list worthwhile? Um, these are all the, the ugly things that you need to know. Um, when you have success, please understand that it is not all about you. It's mostly luck. Everybody that vies for positions in uh, Hollywood or the industry, they're really good at what they do. And so you're up against people that are just as good as you are, if not better. The thing that will make the difference 
is um, whether or not you uh, have a good deal of luck. It's very important to get lucky, and there's no way you can predict it. There's no way you can plan for it. You just have to prepare for it. You have to be ready for it, okay? Um, but if you are successful, don't get too cocky, because that gets back to commandment number one, which is believing your own lie, okay? It's very close to commandment number one. Uh, just take it in stride. Take the bad stuff in stride. Take the good stuff in stride. Never lose track of who you are. The biggest thing that I was talking about, um, the, the, the biggest problem you run into in Los Angeles is any slight flaw that you have gets magnified so that if, you, um, if you're self-destructive, you'll become supremely self-destructive. You'll become suicidal. If you have a drug, you know, if you like to indulge in drugs, you might seriously end up with a serious drug problem. If you like to drink a little bit too much, you might end up an incredible alcoholic. There's something about the environment and the pressure and the, um, just the way things are that makes, you, makes your worst flaw become gigantic. It's like those movies that, that uh, I was talking about this earlier, it's like those movies, those B movies where like a virus manages to hitch a ride on a spaceship to a new planet and because it has no natural predators, no, no antibodies to prevent it from growing, it grows and becomes a gigantic monster. That's sort of the way that things can be sometimes in Los Angeles. Now that's going to seem very fanciful and strange. And you're going to say, I don't know what that guy's talking about. But believe me when I tell you that your biggest enemy sometimes is yourself when you get into the, into the industry. For those of you who are headed into the industry. How many of you want to get into the industry? Because I know that that's not all of you. Okay, that's most of you. That's a lot of you. All right. So this is all worthwhile. Um, clean up your act here. Okay? Clean up your act here. I uh, attended a seminar um, of, of uh, very important uh, and significant showrunners, um, and every single one of them, they were all writer-producers, every single one of them, people who do shows that you know, Breaking Bad and, and, and all the shows you watch, they talked about, at one time or other, they talked about their therapist and being in therapy. And that was not what we were there to discuss. It just came up. And that's because they were working on themselves at the same time that they were dealing with all the pressures of having to do this job. If you have any tiny flaw, this business will magnify it and will allow you, it'll give you enough rope to hang yourself. So um, one of the best pieces of advice that I can give you is clean up your act here before you go out into the real world because the real world is really just going to mess you up. And I know that there are some, some you know, people that you run into who are colorful and cool and they get drunk every night and they do drugs and they're just the most appealing people on the planet, they're going to be dead within about a month if they, you know, if they try to make a living in uh, Los Angeles. I know this for a fact. I've had one friend who OD'd on heroin, and I've had uh, one friend who just a few years ago committed suicide. So this is not fun and games. This is, this is real. And um, it's something that you need to uh, think about, okay? Um, have I scared you yet? Okay, here we go. Um, Oh, I want to get back to uh, luck for a second. Um, I got to tell you this story. <laughs> this, is, this is what luck is all about. So you're an actor. There was, a, there was a very popular TV show called The Man From U.N.C.L.E. It's recently been remade into a movie. Okay. Um, the Man From U.N.C.L.E. was a huge, big show when I was a kid. There was a, the, the runaway star of The Man From U.N.C.L.E. was, was David McCallum. He's currently on um, NCIS. Uh, he plays Ducky. Okay. Um, back in those days, he was young and he was, you know, handsome and he was kind of like a beetle, you know. And he played Ilya Kuryakin, this Russian spy, and he was the big hit of the series. When they shot the pilot for The Man From U.N.C.L.E., there was a guy named Will Kuleva, Will Kuleva, who was Mr. Waverly. He was the boss of the, of the, of the two cool uncle guys. And they shot the pilot. It's, on, it's out on DVD. You can pick it up. And... Um, the network saw the pilot and they said, you know, we like this pilot. They said to the producer, Sam Rolfe, we like this pilot, but we're not too crazy about that guy. Ah, we can't think of his name. It begins with K. So get rid of him. So Sam Rolfe said, okay, great. So he went back and he called up Will Kuleva, the guy who played the boss, and he said, look, the network wants me to get rid of you. Got to get rid of you. All right, okay. 
So that's the end of Will Kuleva on this show that will one day become a huge hit. They go back, they sign all the contracts, they start shooting the show, and the network guy says, well, wait a minute, I told you to get rid of that guy whose name begins with K. And he says, I did, I got rid of Will Kuleva, we replaced him with Leo G. Carroll, what's the problem? He says, no, no, that guy. Well, he was pointing to David McCallum, who played Ilya Kuryakin. He wanted him to get rid of David McCallum. So Sam Rolfe said, well, I'm sorry, all the contracts are signed. We're going to have to go with that character. And, and of course, that became the most popular character on the show, and it was a huge hit. So for McCallum, luck worked in his favor. But for Will Kuleva, it didn't. He was out of a gig and out of money. You know, he, he missed out on that huge popularity and that salary and the whole deal. That's the way the industry works. You can't take it personally. You just have to kind of roll with it, OK? I think that's really the best example of that kind of thing. Um, okay, so we're getting to my 10th commandment. Um, here it is. To, to end on an up note, never lose your sense of fun. Never forget that this industry is fundamentally about fun and entertaining people. Um, the two, two of the biggest guys that I've personally worked with, biggest in terms of industry importance, are two of the people that I think enjoyed having the most fun, Jim Henson and George Lucas. Jim was just fun personified. He was a great guy. He loved to play. He loved people who loved to play. He loved people who were creative, and he let you do your thing. So he was very rare in that respect. I once went to, uh, Cynthia and I once went to have a meeting with him at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And um, we walked in, and there he, he was in a bungalow. And we walked into the bungalow, and he, and he said, uh, I want you guys to. Uh, you know, have you ever seen those posters where dogs are sitting around and they're playing with, uh, they're playing cards? And we said, yeah. Have you seen those posters? You know. He said, uh, I want you to do a show something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and? No, oh, just go off and do something like that. <laughs> You can't beat that. You know, that's how I co-created Dog City, um, which was originally the script that I wrote called Puppy Love. Um, that was a, that was a, a, a Depression-era musical done with dogs and, and dog puppets. And uh, it was then turned into a TV show called uh, Dog City. Um, I'll tell you another funny story about Dog City. I told this earlier in one of the other classes. I had a dog named Buster. He was a whippet. I wrote my dog into Dog City. I wrote him into the script. I described him just the way my dog looks and everything. And, so, and I didn't tell anybody. I just wrote my dog. My dog Buster was in Dog City. So I go to New York to meet with Jim because Jim wants to have a creative meeting. And um, I walk in and uh, he says, uh, and first of all, you go into the Muppet Brownstone in New York back in those days. It looked like a regular brownstone on the, a brownstone on the outside. So there are all these rows of brownstones and this one just looks absolutely the same. And then you walk in and it was like, what? It was, like, it was like Dorothy arriving in The Wizard of Oz. You know, it's like there's Miss Piggy in a glass case, you know, lying, lounging back. And there are all these Skeksis from Labyrinth. And, you know, it was just, it was a real trip. And you go into the, uh, into the conference room and um, there's a portrait. You know, there's a famous portrait called Blue Boy that's, uh, uh, you know, very much of its era. And there's a portrait of Blue Boy at the very end of the conference room with Kermit's head, you know. <laughs> So I go into the conference room, and there are all these puppets on, on the piano. Um, and Jim comes in, and he starts showing me these puppets and what their movements are. You know, you know, this one here, this one has eye movement. And he's, op you know, he's operating these puppets. This one here has a mouth that can smile. And then he picks up a puppet, and it's my dog. It's my dog, Buster. And I now have Jim Henson standing in front of me, operating a Muppet that's my dog. <laughs> And he has no idea that it's my dog. <laughs> no one had any idea that it was my dog. You, you people are the only people you know, that know this, because uh, I, I really just only tell this to my close personal friends. Um, but anyway, that's the fun. That's why you do it, because you have moments like that. George Lucas, I worked with George Lucas. I, did, I spent two weeks up at Skywalker Ranch, which is like, that's another Dorothy you know, entering the Wizard of Oz. It's just rolling hills. And then you go, what are those creatures on the hills? They're like yaks or, or gnu or something, and they're, and they're, they're um, grazing. 
He's got these strange, weird creatures that are grazing on the hills. And it's just, it's idyllic. And I mean, this man literally created this whole little kingdom to himself. And you're, you're sitting in the cafeteria, just like your cafeteria here, where all the workers are, and we're all eating. And I look on the wall, and there's a painting by N.C. Wyeth. And I go, oh, somebody put a nice little print of N.C. Wyeth on the, on the wall. And you go up to it, and you go, oh, no, wait a minute. No, that's the real painting. <laughs> He's an art collector. He owns one of the greatest art collections in the country. And it's mostly um, contemporary uh, um, and a lot of commercial artists. Do any of you know Lion Decker? Uh, Lion Decker, he's one of the biggest collectors of Lion Decker originals. The only, the, like the, the, uh, usually if you go to a, an exhibit and you see a Lion Decker, it's from George Lucas's collection. It might not say that, it might just say anonymous. Uh, Maxfield Parish, do any of you know Maxfield Parish? Okay. Some of the biggest Maxfield Parish, uh, uh, one of the biggest Maxfield Parish collection, <coughs> collections is George Lucas. So you're walking around this place looking at original Maxfield Parishes and, uh, and looking at N.C. Wyatt's and Howard Pyle is another illustrator um, from uh, the early part of the last century. Um, and um, that was, in fact, he had a Howard Pyle over his, uh, over his uh, fireplace in his office. We met every day in his office for two weeks. And the thing I loved about George was he loves to mess around all day just like everybody else on the planet. So we're in there to, you know, to talk over this idea that we're working on and he loved to just goof around and talk and play and have fun and then his person would come in, Patty Burness, who was like the Gestapo, and she'd come in and say, she'd say, George, are you making any progress? We, can only, we only have these people up here for two weeks. And I'd go, okay, fine, you know, okay, I'll get, I'll get some stuff done, you know. And, uh, and then she'd leave and we'd start goofing around some more. Hey, George, George likes to play and he likes to have fun. The other thing that I always t say when I talk about this is that um, right behind me where I would always sit, because you know, once you walk in for the first time and you sit, that becomes your chair for the rest of the time that you're there. You know? That's the way people are. And uh, in, right behind my chair was the chess set from Star Wars. You know those monsters? It was the only thing he had from Star Wars in his office was, uh, was the chess set. So I sat right next to that. Um, okay, so don't forget to have fun. It is about fun, and I don't mean to minimize the fun factor by telling you, you know, all these horrible stories. But the reality is, these, all the horrible stuff that I've talked about, it's all stuff you're going to face. Whether you believe me or not, it is all stuff that you're going to face. And that's one of the great advantages of being a wise old man like myself, is that I know these things, and I, I know them well enough to be able to sort of share them with you. So let's see. Okay. Um, so I say in my, in my speech here, and I hope, uh, I hope you'll remember some of what I've told you tonight, and it will be of some value. Those of you who are turned off by my lecture tonight might want to think twice about entering the industry, and that might be for the best, because like it or not, you'll encounter at least a few of these truths in your quest for fame and fortune. Um, but some of you out there who will decide to move forward no matter what, uh, or some of you out there will decide to move forward no matter what, and good for you, I hope you have great success. Uh, and when you do and you reach the top of your profession, I hope some of what you've learned here tonight will have helped you. You won't remember my name or my face, or at least that's what you'll tell me when I come to you looking for a job. Um, but my guess is that you will undoubtedly have applied some of what you've learned here tonight, and so I guess I have fulfilled my role of boring old fart talking to you in a lecture hall when you'd really rather be home watching the latest season of Daredevil on Netflix. Um, for those of you who came here tonight looking for something a little more highbrow and inspirational, I apologize for letting you down, but maybe this will make up for it. And this is the one page that printed out, so this is the way that I would like to have given this lecture. Live each day with honesty. Oh, these are, this is the code of conduct for cowboys and cowgirls, okay? So I gave you this sort of ugly side of humanity with my early, with, you know, with my talk, but here's the part that will be inspirational so that everybody goes home happy, okay? This is the code of conduct for cowboys and cowgirls. Live each day with honesty and courage. Number two, take pride in your work and always do your best. Number three, stay curious, study hard, and learn all you can. Number four, do what has to be done and finish what you start. Number five, be tough but fair. Number six, when you make a promise, keep it. Number seven, be clean in thought, word, deed, and dress. Number eight, practice tolerance and understanding of others. Number nine, be willing to stand up for what is right. Number 10, be an excellent steward of the land and its animals. 
Number 11, don't inquire into a person's past. Take the measure of a man or woman for what he or she is today. Number 12, never steal another person's horse. A horse thief pays with his life. Remember that. <laughs> Number 13, defend yourself whenever necessary. Number 14, look out for your own. Number 15, remove your guns before sitting at the dining table, unless you're in Texas. <laughs> um, number 16, don't make a threat without expecting dire consequences. Number 17, never pass anyone on the trail without saying howdy. That's important in Hollywood, too. Uh, number 18, a cowboy doesn't talk much. He saves his breath for breathing. And number 19, be there for a friend when he needs you. And number 20, honesty is absolute. Your word is your bond. A handshake is more binding than a contract. Live by the golden rule. So there you go. There's something inspirational for those of you who might have been looking for something inspirational tonight. Um, and if you want to be a cowboy, that's great. I'm not a cowboy. I simply play one on TV. So uh, thank you guys for, uh, for coming to this. And uh, I greatly appreciate it. So I feel like I took about three hours to give you that lecture. Uh, I don't know if there's any time left. Do we have time for any questions? We do. Uh, any questions? Does anybody want to ask me anything? Um, do you want to ask me about Spider-Man, or do you want to ask me about Jim Henson, or George Lucas, or yes? Uh huh. It's, which is they're remaking it. Yeah. And what I believe for now, I mean, what I feel, what I believe for these days is Hollywood is gonna probably Hollywood spend expand their like perception, their from rationalism to orientalism. Like. So, like I saw your work, like English work, the some of Miyazaki Hayao's films, and um, something like that. So, mm -hmm. James Cameron, he is preparing for his work to make uh, In Long, which is Japanese animation. Mm -hmm. So what do, you, what do you think about these Hollywood trends? Do you mean the, the, twen the trend of doing more Asian-based subject yes. matter? Well, you know, like anything in Hollywood, it's about money. <laughs> okay, and what happened is suddenly they realized, yeah, I always say things like this and it gets me into all kinds of trouble. You have to kind of look at Hollywood as a giant Ponzi scheme. OK? Um, you know, they're always looking for a source of cash, some sucker who's got a big amount of cash. And they say, give us this cash, and you're going to make a lot more cash. And then they get the cash, and then they stuff their pockets full of cash. And then, um, and then the sucker says, well, what happened to all that money I was going to make? And they go, uh-oh. You know, and then they leave town. Um, so currently, I think the real source of cash that everyone's looking at, and also because there's a huge untapped audience, is uh, the Chinese market. And so there's a lot of activity revolving around China. When I first got into LA in the, in the uh, early 80s, it was uh, the Japanese who were supposedly going to provide all the money. And so the Japanese bought Sony and proceeded to um, place it in the hands of t two people who in some ways I think maybe weren't the best people that they could place it in the hands of. And, and uh, you know, it's... it's um, uh, at one point, the Germans were going to provide all the money, and then for a brief moment, the Indians, you know, all the money was going to come from India, and right now it's China. I think Hollywood's just always looking for money, and um, it's, it's not really always run like a real business. You know, um, only Warner Brothers could have the Lord of the Rings trilogy and then register no profit to the point where Saul Zantz and the Tolkien estate have to sue them for profits? How can you make the Lord of the Rings trilogy and do as well as those, movie did, those movies did and then say, oh, we didn't make any money? Um, you know, that's, you hear about Hollywood accounting, but it's real. You know, I had a thing happen to me with Class Act where um, they said, uh, you, you know, you will get so much money up front, but then you will get like a huge amount of money at the end. And I was brand new, you know, and, and um, to movie writing. So uh, we said, um, yeah, great. You know, so we're going to make X number of dollars. Yeah, you're going to make a, this amount of money up front, which was real small. 
but you're gonna make a whole lot of money, you know, in the end. Well, in, in the fine print, they had said, you make a whole lot of money based upon determination of final credits. Well, I, you know, we're thinking, we wrote the script. I actually wrote the script. Cynthia, you know, edited it. And, um, and so, uh, we're, you know, we're gonna, naturally our name's gonna be on it. Well, Warner's then submits the credits for Class Act and our names aren't anywhere on it. It was my script, but my name's not on it. Well, why did they do that? Because they don't wanna have to pay me that chunk of money. So um, then you go through arbitration. And again, you don't take it personally. I mean, yes, I wept. <laughs> I cried like a baby. But, um, but really what I now know in retrospect is you don't take it personally, it's just business. And they're gonna try to, they're always gonna try to, you know, screw you over. Um, so there's this thing called arbitration. Everyone, every movie goes through arbitration, I, I now know. I didn't know that at the time. Every movie goes through arbitration. And um, we arbitrated and we ended up with sole screenwriting credit, you know, on the movie. So we won. And I did get the payment. But you know, Warner's got to hold on to their money for a little while longer. So they're always looking for money, and right now the Asian marketplace, that's sort of the, you know, the, the way Hollywood looks at, at it, it's, it's sort of like the, you know, the sugar daddy that's going to save it and, and it's going to enable them to jam a lot of money in their pockets. The problem they're having right now is that they're finding that doing a deal with the Chinese uh, marketplace is a little bit harder than they thought. And the Chinese are a little bit cleverer than Hollywood. Hollywood always thinks that they're the cleverest people on the block. You know, like, like um, Enron, you know, the smartest guys in the room. Uh, Hollywood always feels that they're the smartest guys in the room. And in point of fact, you know, I, I think the Chinese are not taken in by any of it, and, um, which I think is great. And so they're kind of doing a dance to figure out how they're going to work with one another. Now, part of that dance is we're going to make lots of movies with, you know, with Asian content. And, and uh, you know, Iron Man's going to fight somebody in, in China. You know, and we're going to do a completely different cut for China that's going to have lots of China stuff in it, uh, lots of Chinese, you know, settings and people and whatnot. Well, okay, Hollywood can do that dance, but it's really just about money. And if one day they discover that they can't make the kind of money that they think they're going to make, then they'll stop. And that's, that's kind of a grim uh, uh, thing, you know, but that's the business. That's the way that the business is. Do I think they should, you know, I'm a huge lover of Chinese film. I'm a huge lover of Japanese film. Uh, and um, I think the Asian marketplace is just, you know, full of great filmmakers. And what I'd love to see happen more is I'd like to see Chinese filmmakers and um, uh, um, Japanese filmmakers come to this country and make great movies because we need great movies to be made. I love superhero films, but you can't exist on a steady diet of superhero films. I grew up wanting to be a filmmaker during the 70s when everybody was making really all those great 70s movies that you all should see. Even though you're children, you should go see Chinatown, which is a great movie. You should go see the Godfather movies. Go see one and two and forget that three exists. <laughs> um, you know, you got to do that stuff. That's really important because this is a point that we made it earlier in one of the other classes. Uh, in, in class act, I did a, uh, a wordplay scene where kid and play were, were having wordplay with one another. One was trying to explain the latest jargon or the jargon that was late, you know, that was happening in 1993 and the other one wasn't getting it. And that was my, my version of the uh, Abbott and Costello classic routine, Who's on First? Had I not known of Who's on First, which we just ran in Vanessa's class because the majority of you had never seen it, um, had I not known of that routine, I never would have thought of that scene. So I took something that pre-existed, you know, that's, that's like in some old black and white film, and I did a version of it, and I made money. You know, you can do that. That's called, that's called an homage. <laughs> That's not stealing, that's an homage. So I did an homage to Abbott and Costello. And it was part of a larger issue, which was that I was trying to establish Kid and Play as a comedy team. So I used as my, as my templates um, Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello, because you can't get any greater comedy teams than those guys. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, a lot of that infused what I did. I mean, you're always building on the past. Shakespeare, a lot of his plays were not original. He was rewriting what were called the King's Plays. So all these plays that we now look at and say, well, yeah, Shakespeare wrote, you know, Hamlet and everything. No, they existed in a previous form, and he just took it and made it better. So um, those who do not, you know, pay attention to history are missing out on, tr on a tremendous learning resource. And I think it's important for you to do that. So I hope I answered your question, sir. You're very welcome. 
Uh, any other questions? And you can ask me anything. Yeah. How you avoid getting the runaround? Um, I don't know that you do. I think what happens is eventually um, you, you put yourself in a position to run around and then eventually something sticks. Um, and you can't take the run around personally. In fact, expect the run around, okay? And run around. And then eventually you'll, something will happen. I told a story in one of the classes earlier, so if any of you have heard it, forgive me. Um, when I uh, got my first job in the industry, um, I went to interview for a job in editorial. Uh, I had been recommended by the head of the company to the head of the editorial department, a guy named uh, Dave Spence. And while I was waiting to go in to meet with Dave Spence, there was a very amiable redheaded guy out in the hallway. He was rewinding some film. And his name was Richard Allen. And he was saying, so, so what's your name? And I, yeah, John Semper. And he said, oh yeah, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Boston. Well, yeah, my wife's from Boston. How do you like that? You know, and we're just talking, and he's just a guy rewinding film. And um, then I went in to meet with Dave Spence, and Dave Spence hated the very look of me. He hated me. He did not want me near him. He, it was one of the worst interviews I've ever had. And he made it very clear. You know, it's one of those interviews where the guy's shaking his head, through, shaking his head no through the whole interview, you know. No, I don't, no, I don't, you know. I mean, you get used to this look, because you'll see it. And uh, I went home, and I thought, OK, well, that, that, that didn't work. Um, but uh, I had given the, uh, the other guy in the hallway my number, just because he you know, was a nice guy. And, you know, and I was new in town, and he, you know, his wife came from Boston. And he called me up, and he said, look, I didn't want to tell you while you were there, but, um, and Dave doesn't know it yet, but Dave's going to be fired. And I'm taking over the department. And I like you. And so you're hired. He said, just give me some time for all of this to happen, and, and you're, you're in. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, 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 I like you. And I'm going to hire a whole bunch of young kids. And you kids are going to all be my department. I want to get a whole bunch of new f young people in. And, uh, and, and so eight weeks later, because nothing in Los Angeles, this should have been one of my commandments, nothing in Los Angeles happens quickly. OK, if, if something's going to happen soon, that means that you're lucky if it happens within two or three months. All right? And so you're always in wait mode. You get used to it after a while. What you do is you don't, you don't wait for anything. You just move on to the next thing. And then when the, other, when the first thing happens, it kind of catches you by surprise. Oh, that's right. I was you know, going to make that movie, or I was going to do that TV show. Um, so eight weeks later, he hired me, and that's how I got my first gig uh, in the business. And, uh, you know, and I had a wonderful time. And the guy that I was sharing the room with was a guy named Dave Solomon, and Dave is now one of the biggest TV directors on the planet. He, I'm always watching TV, TV shows like Grimm and Once Upon a Time and stuff like that, all the genre stuff, Extant, and uh, Falling Skies, and I see Dave Solomon, Dave Solomon, Dave Solomon, Dave Solomon. We used to share a room together. We used to laugh like fools all day long. It was one of the best gigs I ever had, and he was one of the funniest guys I ever knew. So you never know. Don't be afraid of the run around because really it isn't the run around. It's the run about and get to know people and get to meet people and get to, get to be seen. And you never know when the opportunity is going to fall in your lap. It's going to result in giving you your first really good gig. So don't think of it as the run around. And that's part of the thing. Don't look at bad things as bad things. Just look at them as things. You know? um, and don't be, don't be offended by anything. Don't be offended by getting the, getting the run around. You're not that important, but neither am I. Hollywood sees us the same, you know? It's, it's when it needs us and it figures it can make a buck off of us, then we're, we're special. But when it doesn't need us and it, doesn't, it can't make a buck off of us, we're not that important. So don't worry about it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Good, you're very welcome. Next, way in the back. So you talked about uh, fatal flaws. Yes. Um, I had uh, several fatal flaws. Um, not, I'm not talking about uh, drugs or anything like that. I'm actually notoriously anti-substance abuse. Um, no, I had, you know, I'm very sensitive. Uh, I take things too personally. Um, I get really angry. I would get really angry with people. Um, and, uh, you know, you did that to me and therefore you're my mortal enemy. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and I had to learn to really back off on that. Um, and um, I had to work out relationship stuff, you know, because 
Uh, I was very committed to the industry, and so that meant that oh, there was only so much time to really interact with other people responsibly and well. Um, and so that had to be worked out. And um, you know, the reality is no one escapes it because none of us are perfect. So you just have to roll with it. And you know, you have to, you know, and part of my problem is I didn't have the benefit of this lecture. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm talking to you guys about real stuff instead of, you know, get out there and be a good American, you know. And <laughs> I mean, forget that. You know, you're going to run into all this stuff for real. So I'm talking to you so that you will have a little bit of an inkling of what's in store and it won't hit you by surprise. With me, it was like being hit by a two by four, you know, just wham. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Now, how do I deal with that? And um, sometimes I handle things well because I'm incredibly disciplined in some ways. Um, you know, I got through the 70s without doing drugs. No one got through the 70s without doing drugs. <laughs> you know, so I'm really weirdly disciplined. So I'm, I'm and consequently, I'm still here. Um, but, um, you know, you, you do, you will, you will, it's like that scene in uh, Empire Strikes Back where Luke, you know, Yoda brings Luke to the cave and says, go into that cave, boy. And Luke says, I'm not afraid. And he says, you will be, you know. And so Luke goes into the cave and there's Darth Vader and he fights him and then he whacks off Darth, Darth Vader's head and then he opens the helmet and it's, it's his face inside. That's Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Any other questions? There was one in here somewhere. Yes? yes. Hi, my name is Attila. I'm an international student here from Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s, I was literally growing up watching Spider-Man, Jetson, Scooby-Doo. Good. And then, um, it was all um, translated versions, of course. It was mm -hmm. in Turkish. Mm -hmm. And then um, sometimes when we were kids, you know, we watched these shows and then go and talk about it in school. Mm -hmm. And then I really want to thank you for such a great like show. Well, like thank um, you. For the 90s generation, at least. Well, you're very welcome. And then, um, it's my pleasure. Uh, my question is like, what's your thinking process while you're coming up with this uh, show? And then each episode of something is different. You know, like, yep. What's the process? That's a very good question. Uh, the process is very simple. There is, there is a formula to every good story. Uh, I was talking about this earlier in one of the classes with a bunch of writers. Um, you cannot run a show if you cannot think up stories on the fly very quickly because shows are not about creating great art, they are about getting entertainment out the door. We were doing one script a week on Spider-Man, we did not have time. There, there is no such thing as writer's block. If you have writer's block, then you should not be working on a show. Uh, and you shouldn't have writer's block anyway because all writer's block means is that, is that you've set things up different, you've set things up wrong, incorrectly, you've made a mistake. And you have to go back and set things up again. You can't be the kind of writer who lets the muse strike and goes, you know, how am I feeling today? Oh yes, okay, you can't be that kind of writer. <laughs> you, you have to have a formula, you have to know how to write a story, you have to know how a story, you have to know the rhythm of a story. Uh, it's not that hard, really. It's, it's um, I was <laughs> saying in, the, in a previous class, it's not that hard to entertain people. You know, there's a video online right now that's making the rounds, there's a dog in, a, in an airplane, and he's going ba 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 and then he gets to another dog on a cloud, and the dog goes ba 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 ba, and he goes ba 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 ba, and then they start doing the theme song to uh, the Greatest American Hero ba 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 ba. I watched that about three times. <laughs> so how how hard can it be to write a story that's going to hold people's attention? Really, when you stop and think about how easy it is to to entertain people. So you know, a lot of people get very carried away with the idea of writing and oh. I've got to write in the muse and oh my god and the history of mankind and the fate of the world. No, just write the damn thing. Just get the thing out the door. My favorite era for writing was the pulp era because those guys were getting paid a penny a word and they needed to eat. And so they cranked out words and they just banged them out. I mean, there was one writer that you know, said he, he would line up his, his chocolate and his cigarettes and he'd start typing and he'd just bang out a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, there was a great writer named uh, um, Walter Gibson who wrote a novel a month. He had to write a shadow, a sh you know what I mean by pulp writers, pulp guys who wrote these magazines that, are, that we now call the pulps because the paper that they wrote on was, that they printed these things on was so bad that you could actually see the wood pulp in them. Okay, you know, it was like the cheapest paper that they could buy. And these magazines were incredibly successful. They, they sold them for like a nickel a piece. 
And the guys who wrote for these magazines had to crank out a ton of verbiage. Walter Gibson wrote a novel a month. It was a, a new shadow novel every month. Those guys had no time for rewrites. Nobody edited them. And there's something raw and wonderful about that material that I love. Okay, That's where we get the shadow, who in many ways is the precursor of Batman. That's where everything that we know in pop culture comes from. That's where we got Tarzan. A little later, that's where we got Dashiell Hammett. That's where we got Raymond Chandler. That's where we got uh, Arthur C. Clarke. They all came from the pulps. And, and they, they cranked out, they had to crank out a ton of material. And that's the way TV writing is. You have to crank out a ton of material, and it has to be good enough to get on TV. Um, that's why I love it that you say that you guys went and talked about the show, because I really tried to make Spider-Man a good show, despite the fact that we had to crank out a script a week. Because really, you know, it wasn't required for me to make it good. It was re required for me to get it done, OK? And um, yeah, you know. It's formula, you know. Do you know about Joseph Campbell and the monomyth? Do any of you guys know about Joseph Campbell? Who knows? Jo okay, Joseph Campbell discovered that mostly all mythology had basically the same structure. Why? Because we're all human, and there's a certain thing that we like that entertains us psychologically. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a very complicated thing and making it very simple because I know that you guys have to get home. Um, but um, he called it the monomyth, and there's a certain structure. You know, the hero is always reluctant to be a hero, and he goes through a bunch of trials and tribulations, and then he learns something, and he grows, and by the end of, this, of, of the cycle, he's, you know, he's a grown, uh, uh, advanced you know, person. And that's fundamentally what every story that you see is. Uh, and then people have made a cottage industry out of breaking this down into all kinds of subcategories, and this, that, and they have names for all these things. I don't know that that's necessary. I think what you really just do have to understand that you need a beginning and a middle and an end. And I'll tell you, really, in a nutshell, you need a beginning and a middle and an end, and the hero has to learn something, and there can only be one hero. So if you're trying to write about two people and make them both the subject of something, you're screwed. <laughs> and um, you, know, and, and, uh, you have to put a new twist on something so it doesn't look like something everyone's seen before. But the structure is basically the same. So you just, um, my mandate with Spider-Man was it's opera. So you always have to find that opera, operatic moment where Peter's going, oh, I've lost Mary Jane, you know, and it's just opera without the music. And um, uh, it's really the story of Peter Parker. It's not the story of Spider-Man. So if you concentrate on Peter's life, and then Spider-Man is just another thing that complicates his life, um, that's, then, you're, then you're in good shape. You know, if you try to make it about Spider-Man and, oh, he's going to fight this villain, and this villain has this power, and, eh, you know, who cares? Um, but Peter, we're not super, super heroes, so we can't really relate to superheroes. That's like an extension of our fantasy. The only thing we can relate to is a hum another human being. And Peter Parker was a very vulnerable human being. I really like Peter uh, a lot. And um, he's sort of Charlie Brown in a different form. Uh, and a lot of bad things happen. And he's a real believer in love, and he's a real idealist. And so you know, find ways to put him through things where he has to learn stuff. And, uh, and, and grow as a human being. It's a coming-of-age story. Spider-Man is a coming-of-age story. In my Bible for the series, that's, this is uh, the stuff I wrote. You know, find the operatic moment, um, put him through his paces, and remember that it's Peter's story and that it's really a coming-of-age story. So, Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Last question. You get to ask the last question. I'm sorry, this fellow back here had his hand up. Yeah. Yes. Um, so why do it at all? What, what do you get? You make a ton of dough. <laughs> um, and you get to see stuff get out there. You get to see your art reach a huge audience, like this gentleman who was in Turkey. I've never been to Turkey, and he was watching my art. OK? So you do it. You know, I used to tell my writers, always respect the fact that you are being given an opportunity to make a film. Hollywood is paying to make your film. You're writing something, and then Hollywood is spending the money to make it. Who's, making, who's paying for your film right now? Your parents? You? You know, this school? I mean, Hollywood's going to make your film. And you're going to write something. And, and, it's, and it would always drive me crazy when these writers would come in, and they'd write a show, and they'd go, ah, it's Moon Dreamers. You know, so I'm just going to write Moon Dreamers with a show I did for Hasbro. I'm just going to write any old thing. And, ah. You go, no, dude, that's 12 minutes that Hollywood is going to pay to make your story. Honor that. Respect that. That's what you're, you know, that's what you're in it for, really. 
Um, so no, it's great. You know, I, I did 65 half hours of Spider-Man. It was straight out of my head and onto the page and onto the screen and Hollywood paid for that. What's the, there's no bad to that. What I think you're asking is if you're not going to be nurtured as an artist, um, why do it? Well, you are going to be nurtured as an artist. It's just that Hollywood's not going to care whether or not you're nurtured as an artist. Hollywood does not care about that, but you, it doesn't mean that you don't care about it. And I grew greatly as an artist by doing Spider-Man, but nobody cared. You know, I cared, and, and the, you know, the gentleman from Turkey cared, and you guys that watched the show cared. But Hollywood didn't, didn't care, nor did it need to, nor should it care. Uh, it's not their job. You know, they're not my caretaker. They're not my parent. So um, you guys have been great. Thank you, thank you even for sticking around for the rest of this. Uh, you know. Thank you.